Today's stuff we're going to be learning is the Daf for Shabbat. It's Nadarim Daf Lamed Tet. We're going to start at the bottom of Lamed Chet Amabed with the Mishnah. Hamudar han ame chaviro v'nichnas levakro omer v'lo yoshev. If I can't, well, we're going to have to figure out who can't benefit from who, but someone can't benefit from someone else, and one of them is sick in the, in the hospital or in their house. Omer v'lo yoshev. The other one can come visit, but only standing, not by sitting. We're going to have to figure out in the Gemara why this is. You can basically visit with them and make them feel good, but you can't actually give them money in order to help heal them because they're not allowed to benefit from your money. This sounds, by the way, to be more that if I'm the sick person, I'm forbidden to benefit from you, you can't give me any money to help me get better. What is the case? Uh, if, as I explained, I'm the sick person, I'm not allowed to benefit from you, you're the person visiting, well then, if I can benefit from you by standing, I can benefit from you from sitting, meaning it's all permitted. Why is it permitted? Because I'm not really benefiting from you. Why am I not really benefiting? The Ron says that since you're doing a mitzvah, it's the mitzvah that you're gaining. That's the whole gain, really. It's true I'm getting benefit, but you're really doing it for the mitzvah, not necessarily for my sake. Now, it's a little bit, right? It's not. We hope that people are doing it not just for the mitzvah. But the fact is, since you're getting a mitzvah, therefore, it's not considered that I'm getting benefit from it. So now, they say, so if that's the case, sitting, standing, it should all be permitted. And if the reverse, my possessions are not allowed to be, you can't benefit from them, and you come visit me. Well, well, then you came into my house to visit me, assuming you're in my house. You're now benefiting from me because you're using my house. So even if you stand, it should be an issue. So we're going to have three different explanations. Two, and we're going to read it first, that it's that I can't benefit from you. Again, I'm the sick person, you're the visitor. I can't benefit from the visitor. We're going to explain that in two different ways. One is Shmuel. One's going to be based on Rabbi Shimbin Ali Yakim says somewhere else. And then we're going to have a second explanation, uh, a third really, which is going to be the other direction. So Shmuel says, where we said then, really theoretically, I should be able to benefit without a problem. So why is sitting a problem? Well, it's a place where you get paid for, for visiting someone when you're sitting. You don't get paid visiting them standing, but you do get paid visiting them when you're sitting. The Ron explains, how could this be? So he says that really what happens is that it's a mitzvah. You can't get paid for doing a mitzvah, but the base mitzvah is to come visit me. You could do that standing. Therefore, if you stay and you sit, you already get paid. Now, in this case, what happened? You came to visit me. You sat, and that's why the mitzvah says you can't, because you didn't charge me. So I benefited from you because you didn't charge me as we've seen in a number of cases. So that's the situation. They say that some people didn't, like there were, there were customs to yes, take money for sitting, and there were customs not to take money because people said if you take money for sitting, people might come and take money for standing. So they didn't do it at all, but this Mishnah would be in a case where they did take money. My Psaka, so now they say, but why would the Mishnah distinguish difference between a place where they get money and a place where they don't get money, or they place get money for sitting, they don't get money for standing. Well, this is teaching you what we just said before, which is that the reason why you can get paid sitting and you can't get, the reason why it's talking about a place where you can get paid, where the minag is to get paid sitting is because they want you to know that when you can take money, it's only for sitting and not for standing. Okay, and therefore, you learn that also in this Mishnah. Okay, that's something that, if assuming you explain like Shmuel, that's something you would learn from our Mishnah. So again, you can take money for sitting, but you cannot take money for standing. Okay, the, the, the Mefarish Rashi, what looks as Rashi here, says that basically you, can, you can't take for standing the Araihu. Because it's, it's very... You know, it's you don't really get paid for just standing some and visiting someone. That's not considered serious. Some people say, as he said elsewhere, which is on a Mishnah on Daf Membet, which we're going to get to, which is, if you have a field on the Shemitah year, which is Hefkir, basically ownerless, so anyone can come in and take fruits. 
Let's say I can't benefit from you and you have a field, so I can go in because it's ownerless. However, the halacha is that I can't actually go into the field. I can take fruits that are hanging outside the field. Why? So Rishon explains, We're worried that if you walk into the field, you might end up spending time in the field and then benefiting from the field, not only for the purposes of picking fruits. Let's say you're happy to be in the shade of my trees. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm happy to be in the shade of your trees. That would be me benefiting from you. And that's why we're worried. So hachanami, likewise here, zera shamayash habayishiva. If you sit down in the hospital or in somebody's house, you when you go visit them, so you're sitting in my house, when you visit me, I'm not allowed to benefit from you. Now, you can do the base mitzvah of bikor cholim, but maybe you'll stay longer. And maybe it's, maybe it's a place where they don't generally get paid. But if you stay an hour, then maybe you would get paid. And then again, if I, you don't charge me money, then I'm benefiting from you. Okay, so that's the concern. It's not actually a concern to sit. It's a concern that you might stay too long, and staying too long would mean that I'm actually then benefiting from you. Ula. So those were two different explanations. Again, Shmuel's being that it's a place where they generally take money for sitting, and that's why. Or, according to Rabbi Shem ben Yakim, which is, it's not necessarily that they're taking money, it's that maybe you'll stay longer and then they'll actually be able to take money. And if they don't, then I'm benefiting from, from them. Ula Omer. Third explanation, which is really the second option, which is the Olam Chola Asurina Mevakil. Which is really talking about when you can't benefit from me. I'm a sick person, and you're forbidden to benefit from the sick person. Ukigon de lo adre min chiyute. But what's the case? I said, I forbid you for benefiting from me, unless my life depends upon it. So that's why you can come visit me, because my life depends upon it. To which the Gemara asks, Well, then why make this distinction standing sitting? Either which way? To which they answer, Because it could be done by standing, and therefore it's sitting is considered benefit. So what I need desperately is for you to come visit me but I don't need you to come visit me and sit down, okay? I just need you to visit me. So therefore, by sitting down, you're already gaining benefit from being in my house, okay? Um, before we move on, I forgot to mention something important, which is in the case of Rabbi Shimon ben Yakim, that there's a concern if you, if you sit, that maybe you'll sit too long, why is standing okay? So the Ron says, since you're making him stand, there's a heck here. You'll remember that you can't stay too long. So this reminds me of a few things. Number one, you ever go into, you start a conversation with someone and then you're just schmoozing and you really, you don't want to stay a long time. So you don't actually, let's say you drop by somebody's house to drop something off and then you end up in conversation. This happens to me a lot. And then you end up in a long conversation with them and then, you know, they say, why don't you sit down? And all of a sudden you're like, no, no, I really have to go. Because as long as you were standing, you knew that you were on your way out the door. As soon as you, you know that if you sit down, you're not getting out of there too quickly. So sitting is that way of kind of saying, oh, I could really be here a long time. The other thing I was thinking of, people do business meetings. It's a, it's a thing people do, you know, five or 10 minute or 15 minute business meetings and they do them standing up because that's how they know it'll be short and concise and it won't go over time. So these are all things that you can see. They were understanding of them in the Gemara as well. Okay, next. Now we're going to have May today. A question on one of the opinions and we'll see in a minute which one. If he gets sick, you can go in to visit him. But if his son gets sick, you can only ask about him in the shuk, but you can't go visit him. So now, who is forbidden to who? Which opinion are we going by? Ula or Shmuel, right? Which direction does it go? This makes sense according to Ula. Why? Because again, what did Ula say? It's when I'm a sick person and I can't benefit from you, but it was a case, what did Ula say? Where I said, unless my life depends upon it. So now they say, It was a case where I didn't, I didn't make you, you know, as I said, if my life depends on it, then yes, then you can benefit from me. And now what's the case? Halahu, right? If I'm sick, then he can come in. But if my son is sick, then he can't. Why? Because I said, only if my life depends upon it. 
but this isn't my life that depends upon it. It's my child's life that depends on it. And that was not included in my stipulation. So it could be, I meant that as well, but I didn't say so. And therefore it's not included. So again, I said, you can't benefit from me unless my life depends upon it. My life depended upon it. Therefore we let me in, right? we let you come in, but not if, if it's my son's life. Cause I didn't say if my son's life depends upon it or my child's life. But according to Shmuel, we said it's the visitor who is for, is forbidden. And that's, I can't benefit from the visitor. Sorry, I didn't say it right before. It's when, right, now I said it. I can't benefit from the visitor. Then, what's the difference if it's, if I get sick or my son gets sick or, or I guess in this case it would be, Maishna, one second. Right. If you're, if, if I can't benefit from you, then it shouldn't matter if I'm sick or my son is sick, either which way I can't benefit from you. You can't come into my house at all. So I'm sorry. You can't be, sorry. Now I'm getting confused. Sorry. Shmuel said, I can't benefit from you. What's the difference? Whether it's me who's sick or my son is sick. Why am I confused here? The nechassim of the visitor are forbidden to me. I can't benefit from him. What's the difference, him or his son? I actually think, let me just double check this. Maishna who, Maishna no. Right. It shouldn't matter if I get sick or my son gets sick. Neither of us, right? If I didn't forbid you, Tarla Vakir. My dear law, sorry, Ben Omidara, I don't mean I know. If, right, if I can't benefit from him, it shouldn't make a difference whether it's me or it's my son who's sick. Right, in other, right, that's the issue. If I can't benefit from you, and what did we say? You can come and stand, right? And Chala, he says, you can come in. So of course, if my son gets sick, you can come in. My son isn't forbidden to benefit from you at all. So it should be non, a non-issue. So it really makes no sense. Amar lecha, so now they say, Shmuel could explain the following. The fact that the Mishnah was talking about one case and the bride was talking about a different case, that shouldn't bother us. When the bride said, right, they meant if the other person, if, if the visitor is forbidden to benefit from the sick person. So again, if they were forbidden and they said, unless I really need it, my life depends upon it, then if their life depends upon it, then yes, but not their son's life or their child's life. But the Mishnah was talking about the opposite case where I, I as the sick person can't benefit from you. And then that would fit in well with the Mishnah. It just doesn't fit well in the Brayta, but that doesn't bother us. To which the Gemara said, my Pesaka, why should the Mishnah and the Brayta be talking about different cases? So I'm a Rava. In other words, really the question is, why did Shmuel, if he understood the bright in one way, think that the Mishnah was a different case? So he says, Maniti Kashita, the Mishnah itself is difficult. My area detani omed avalo yoshev. Shma minad, dimichse mevakir, asurim ala chole. According to Shmuel, he didn't make any sense to say what's the difference standing or sitting. And therefore, he was pushed into saying that the Mishnah must be a case where, because again, if you don't say my life depends upon it, then there's no reason to make this distinction. And therefore, you now that was Ula, but basically he said it doesn't make any sense and it only makes sense, the Mishnah, according to, again, Ula came up with an explanation, but according to Shemuel, it didn't seem to make sense to him. Why distinguish standing and sitting unless it's an issue that I can't benefit from you, I'm the sick person, and therefore whether you sit or stand is affected by the salary and all of that. Now we're going to go off on a big tangent about the importance of visiting sick people, which is a great suga, and we're not even going to finish it today. Where do we learn about Bikor Chodim? Interestingly enough, we're going to learn it in a surprising situation. We're going to learn it from Korach. In the Korach story, remember, they said bad things about Moshe and Aaron that made it look like they shouldn't be the leaders. And Moshe does a whole showdown with them, and he says, Im kimot kol anashim yimutun elu, uf kudat kol adam, 
if these people die in a normal, natural way, which we'll talk about in a minute, and kudat kol adam, which we'll get to and explain what that means, usually means people attend to them or something. Um, the rest of that pasuk, sorry, it doesn't quote it here, kudat kol adam yipaked alehem, then lo Hashem shlachani. If they die a natural death, then you'll know that it wasn't God who sent me, says Moshe. The next pasuk is, yivra Hashem, but if God creates something, and the ground swallow, you know, opens up its mouth, and swallows them up, and everything with them, and they go down into the depths, then you'll know that these people anger God and that it was a punishment from God. So now we're going to have to say, how do we get from the first pasuk uh, 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 an allusion to visiting sick people? My mashma, how do you get it? Amarava, in kemot kol adam yimutun elu, if like everybody normally dies the natural way, which is shehem cholim umutalim bari satan, that they're sick and lying in their beds, ubenei adam yivakrin otam, because it said yivkod kol adam, as people will come and visit them, then Then people can say, God obviously did not send me. Darash Rava, Rava further, Darash in these Pesukim. That was Rava explaining that Pesuk. Now Rava Darash in the next Pesuk. Now we're going to get a little bit off, off topic and then go back after the visiting sick people. V'im bri'a yivra Hashem. Im bri'a, what is the bri'a? What, if God, what is God going to create? Gehenom. Then mutav if God creates Gehenom, perfect, then it'll swallow them up. Ve'im lav, yivra Hashem. And if not, in other words, if God, sorry, I, I meant, to, meant to say it like this. In bri'a yivra Hashem, if God already created Gehenom, then great. And that's how they'll be destroyed. Ve'im lav, yivra Hashem. And if not, he'll create it now. To which the Gemara says, Ini, how could that possibly be? Va'atanya, there's a bright that says, Shiva advarim nivra'u kodem shenivra ha'olam. You seem to be seven fundamental ideas that were created before the creation of the world. There's a whole debate where they actually created was just the idea for them hatched, but maybe created later. What exactly it means, but the idea is that these are basics of the world. The world is kind of, you know, the foundations of the world. The Elohim, Torah, okay, Torah, Tshuva, repentance, Gan Eden, the Gehenom, right, reward and punishment, you could say. Kisea Kavod, the seat of God. Ubeta Mikidash, the temple, right, which obviously wasn't created till later, but that's why it seems clear these weren't exactly created then. Ushmosh Mashiach, and the name of the Messiah, meaning again, the concept that the Messiah will come also. Torah, how do we know all these things? We're now going to prove it from verses. Dichtiv, Hashem Kanani Reshit Darko. God acquired it, right, or gave it to us in the beginning of his path. Okay, he already acquired it. Before the mountains were created and the the things were were placed down. In other words, you were there before. Okay, so that's showing that the idea of repentance. Just one minute. How do we get repentance from here? Let me see if the run says anything. No, run doesn't say anything here. Just want to check one thing. And it doesn't exactly talk directly about repentance in this verse. Um, ah, that's why it does. Because then it says, Vatomer Shuvu B'nei Adam. The next verse is, and then people will be told they can go back and repent. That's what I was missing. Okay, next. Um, tashev, ad, uh, sorry, tashev Enosh Adaka V'Shuvu Bani. That's why. I just didn't read far enough. Tashev Enosh Adaka. And then it says, but to write, people will go until Dika'on, like down. And then, Batomer Shuvu Ben Adam. And then God will say, come back, and there'll be repentance. So this was all before the mountains were created. That means before the creation of the world. Gan Eden Dichti, Vayita Hashem Elokim Gan Be'eden Mikedem. From before. Gehenom Dichti, Ki Aruch Me'etmol Tafteh. Tafteh is a word for Gehenom, and Aruch Me'etmol, that was already planned from yesterday. Your seat has been ready from way back when. That the, this is a passage referring to the temple, the seat of God's glory, will is made rishon from before. His name will be forever, and it seems also from right before even. 
Okay, it says, Yehishmo uh, le'olam, actually the end of that pasuk is more important, the continuation, Lefnei Shemesh Inon Shmo. That's where the name of Mashiach is. And it's before the sun, seeming to say, before the sun was created. Elahachi Kamar. So now we're back to this pasuk, which is this problem, which is how could you say Gehenom will be created if Gehenom was created from before the creation of the world? Elahachi Kamar. What he meant to say is like this. If the, if the Gehenom had a mouth, then great. And if not, open a mouth, make an opening so that they can get swallowed up in the ground. It obviously was there, it just might not have had an easy opening. Famous Pasuk from Kohela, which appears a number of times there, nothing new under the sun. Even the mouth of Gehenom must have been there before. If its mouth is not close to here, well then, move it closer to here, okay? We know there had a mouth and an opening, but move it right here, Moshe said. Okay. So now we go back to this Pasuk that we quoted about the name of the Mashiach, and it says in the Pasuk, um, uh, Sorry, no, 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 that's not the Pasuk. I got confused. We're going to go back to the sun, but in a different context. Darish Rava, Va'amre la Rabbi Yitzchak. So maybe Rabbi said this, maybe Rabbi Yitzchak. My dechtiv shemesh yareach amad zvula. Okay, here's a different pasuk about the sun. Shemesh yareach amad zvula. Okay, the sun and the moon stood in zvul. Zvul is a, is a word used, zvul tiparto. It's the, the glory of God is in the zvul. And it says in the, the Gemara questions this pasuk. It's a pasuk in Chavakuk. Okay, I'll read the whole pasuk. Shemesh yareach amad zvula. They're going to go in the way of your arrows. To the light of the, the shine of your sword. So now we have to understand this very strange pasuk. What is, a, what is it referring to? So, what is the sun and the moon doing in Zvul? That's where God sits. They're in the Rakia, which is lower than the Zvul up in the heavens. Now, why are we quoting this pasuk? Because this has to do with Korach. We're back to the Korach story, which from there we use to prove this idea of Bikor Cholim, right? Fascinatingly. You wouldn't have thought you'd learn it from Korach. But because there it seems to describe the world, way of the world, people get sick and die. And while they're sick, people visit them. So now, a different thing about Korach. So while they were there, and we already had this whole thing about Moshe saying, you know, let the ground open up, and what exactly are we creating? We had a whole debate, figured it out. Now, they say the following. So, Melamed, when the whole Korach story went down, the sun and the moon got very upset at God, and they said, they went up to Zvul, from their spot, they rose up. We'll go do our thing. We light up, you know, in the night and in the daytime. We'll do what we're supposed to do if you show justice to, Ma- to the son of Amram, to Moshe. And if not, we're not going to go out and light up the world. God started shooting arrows at them and throwing swords at them and got very angry with them. Why did he get angry? Every day people bow to you. People worship the sun. People worship the moon. They're basically worshiping idols through you against me, who's God. And he says, and you never complained, protested. How could it be all these people are, are, are dis- disgracing God? But when it comes to a human and Moshe Rabbeinu, if you're making a whole big stink, that's not appropriate. What about me? And therefore, There's different ways of understanding this, but it seems that after that they took lesson and they realized, wow, we really shouldn't go out every day because we really are just right, uh, ruining the glory of God by having people bow down to us. So God had to basically shoot them out with arrows and swords to get them to rise every single day. Because at that point, God convinced them that maybe they shouldn't even rise every day. And that basically every day, they're pushed out by God. It's a very interesting image. They're pushed out by God with swords and arrows 
basically chasing them out to make sure they do their job. Okay, and that was all because they were trying to protect Moshe, which looked like a good thing. But God said, you know, why didn't you ever do that for me? You have a little bit misplaced, you know, your 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 respect for me is a little bit misplaced. And from then on, they took it to heart and got us to push them out every day. Okay, back to Bikor Cholim. Tanya, Bikor Cholim en la shiur. There's no requisite amount. My en la shiur, what does that mean? Sever Rav Yosef lemeimer ain't shiur the matan schachal. Rav Yosef wants to say it means the amount of reward you could get is boundless. To which Amr Le Abaye, Bachim Mitzvot, Yesh Lo Shiur Lamatan Scharam. What do you mean? Mitzvot, like other mitzvot, have a certain amount of how much reward you're supposed to get. What do you mean? The Hatznan doesn't it say in the Mishnah? Heveza here, but Mitzvah Kala Kibachamura. You should be just as careful with light mitzvot, simple mitzvot, than with strict ones. Sheinat Hayodeh Matan Scharam Shal Mitzvot. You have no idea how much they're worth. So to say this mitzvah has boundless. What about everything? We don't know. We have no idea what the what the reward is for any mitzvah. Ema shiur means, don't think, first of all, for example, uh, returning a lost item. If you're an elderly person and it's not respectful for you to go returning your lost item to some little kid, you know, it's beneath you to be searching around the streets, bending down, picking up lost items on the floor, you actually are exempt. But here, even a gadol needs to go to a katan, even the less important person needs to be visited by more important people, or a young person should be visited even by older people. It's a very important mitzvah. Rav Amar, filu me'apanim biyom. There's no bounds of how many times you could do it a day. Go do a hundred times a day. Amar bi'ach abrachanina. Kolam evakir cholen notel echad mishishim b'tzaro. If you visit a sick person, you take away one sixtieth of their pain. It's a very important line, right? It's very famous, actually. Amar ilan, here's a great question. Let's take that mathematically. If everybody takes away one sixtieth of their pain, let's have 60 people visit every sick person. Okay, well, well, number one, make a minimum, and number two, make a maximum. Once 60 people visit it, they should be fine, right? which we know doesn't really work. So why don't we do that? Which you might remember, it's like the 10th of Rebbe, which you might remember, it's what we call the half-life. Um, you might remember from Mesechet, Ketuba. We'll get to it right now. Ube ben Gilo. And it has to be someone who's your age. So first of all, they assume it's very hard to gather 60 people who are your age. Some people say, what does it mean your age? Maybe it has to be your, your mazal. Some people think that that has to do with someone who was born in the same time period as you. Um, it's a little bit hard to understand this ben Gilo, why that's important to someone who's your own age range. Detanya. Especially because we said before, Gadol should go to a katan. But maybe the taking away the one sixtieth is only if it's someone your age. Ditanya, Rebbe Omeel. So Rebbe says, now we have to understand what's this Isiriyata Debe Rebbe. Uh, so they say, what is this? Uh, sorry. Rebbe Omeel, Omeel, Ba Tanizonim in Chse Achim, Notelet Isur Nechassim. If you learned too, but you might remember this. A daughter who gets, the, husband, the father dies, the, the estate has to support the daughters, but the brothers inherit the estate. So now she gets a tenth. She also is supposed to get her dowry. She gets a tenth of the property for her dowry. She gets a tenth of the dowry. Each of the girls are going to take a tenth. The son's going to end up with absolutely nothing. Each one takes a tenth of what's left, not a tenth of the whole thing. Each person takes a 60th of the person who's sick of his pain. Then the next person comes in and takes a 60th of what's left. And the next person a 60th of what's left. That's very different. And that's how we end up, we, you know, it'll go on forever. Because as much as Bikor Cholim is important, it's never going to fully make a person recover, according to this. Um, in the case of the daughters, you might remember this, after each of them gets a tenth, and then the next one, a tenth of what was left, and a tenth of what was left, a tenth of what was left, then they all go up, and between the two of them, in other words, uh, between the, well, however many there are, let's say there's ten, so the sum will be still left with whatever's left, because there'll still be something left, and the daughters will divvy it all up evenly, because the end, it wasn't really even, which is a difficult question we said there, because what do you mean? The first one got it, and it was hers legitimately fair and square. The fact that then there was a second daughter and she needed more money, it's not her problem. 
So some of the commentaries say it's when they all get married on the same day, or get it betrothed on the same day, and they need their dowry at the same time. Then we do it in this order and then split it all evenly at the end. Um, okay, let's stop here. We'll start another story tomorrow. We'll get to some stories about Bikor Cholim and some other interesting things about visiting sick people. A very, very important mitzvah. I just want to go back to something we saw earlier where we discussed it more from a technical perspective, sitting or standing, but really the idea of visiting sick people, and even some of the commentaries talk about this, that sitting provides companionship also. Like even though the base mitzvah can be done standing, you have to think about how to do it. Right? And that there's a way to do it, there's a way to sit, there's a way to speak. It's interesting, they say, you know, you could do it a hundred times a day, but you have to be careful probably not to visit the same person a hundred times a day. There's also, even though en la shior, there's no limit, there's a limit in terms of what the person can accept. And you always have to be conscious of the sick person. Right? It's not, like, it's, it's interesting because sometimes you go visit sick people really for your own sake. You want to see what's going on with them, you want to be on top of what's happening, but you always have to remember that there's a sick person on the other side and you have to be sensitive to what their state of mind is and, and what's happening with them and what they can tolerate and how much they really want to be visited. Um, anyway, I thought the standing and sitting was also very interesting in terms of your, you know, your actions when you stand up and when you sit and what kind of vibe that sends both to yourself and to the people around you. And that while you might be able to do it if you're mudar hana'ah from someone, you can only stand and not sit. But... If you're not mudar hana'an, you can benefit from them, or you can benefit them, then you should sit and you should spend the time properly, again, assuming it's what the sick person wants. With that, a lot of uh, thoughts about Bikor Cholim, wishing everybody a Shabbat Shalom or Shavuot Tov.